Hey guys, welcome to our podcast. This is a production of the World History Since the 15th Century class at London Christian High. My name's Karina. And my name's Terza. We're going to be talking about Africa and the slave trade. As most people know, slavery is a sensitive topic, so we would like to give a content warning. We will be talking about racism, abuse, slavery, and discrimination. We are not a voice for people that are African or of African descent. We are basing our information on archaeological and written historic evidence. African or oral traditions may differ, and we are not the authority on oral traditions, but fully respect the narrative and encourage you, the listeners, to find out more. So as we hopefully all know, slavery is illegal. But what caused it to happen in the first place? Why did it exist? And how did it end? Great questions, Karina. For anyone else who's wondering, stay tuned and we'll teach you everything you need to know. Let's begin at the beginning. Before slavery, Africa had a completely different reputation than they do now. Over 5,000 years ago, Africa was one of the most successful, advanced, and prosperous continents in the world. They had a very rich culture full of people skilled in medicine, mathematics, astronomy, and many other areas. Africa was filled with the production of domestic goods and luxury items like bronze, ivory, and gold, which were all used for trading and local use. They even had a kingdom called Tai Seti, which could have been the earliest state ever to exist. They are credited with many ancient developments, especially scientific ones, involved with engineering, math, architecture, and medicine. Egypt was probably the most involved in these scientific developments. Some political developments, like state formation and monarchy, may have originated in parts of Africa as well. So really, Africa was completely different than it seems to be now. They used to be full of ideas, production, prosperity, culture, and wealth, but now they seem to be one of the most struggling continents on the globe. For that, we mostly have slavery to blame. Not a lot of people know this, but slavery actually existed for a long time before it became such a large issue. It just wasn't talked about nearly as often because of how small the groups of people who were being enslaved were. Slavery reached its peak from 1650 to 1807, which is the well-known period where slavery became much more common. This is also called the transatlantic slave trade, which was the most widespread and recent slave trade. Some of the causes of slavery included the importance of West Indian colonies, the shortage of labor, failure to find alternative sources of labor, racial attitudes or stereotypes, and religious factors, like in Genesis chapter 9, where slavery is considered to be being justified by God. All of these factors resulted with the consequence of slavery and gave many people years of trauma and hurt, which we'll talk more about later. Slavery was a continuity in many societies throughout history. Before the transatlantic slave trade came to be, slavery primarily occurred in the Mediterranean and Indian Ocean Basin. A huge change that the transatlantic slave trade brought was that it made slavery much more widespread. Another huge change uh, this, t- this trade brought to the slave trade is that before the transatlantic slave trade, many slave owners treated their slaves well as part of their households. This changed immensely during the transatlantic slave trade as slaves were treated as property and less than human. Also, there was a change in how slavery was viewed. Before the transatlantic slave trade, slavery was more often associated with warfare and capture. However, the transatlantic slave trade made slavery more about race. When this popular time with the transatlantic slave trade began, it took off very quickly after there was an increasing demand for sugar in Europe. There were many different trade routes involved, which connected Africa, Europe, and the Americas. The transatlantic slave trade followed a triangular route. European traders came to ports by the west coast of Africa, picked up slaves, and brought them to the Americas. The voyage from Africa to the Americas was called the Middle Passage, which we'll get into later. Other passages brought Africans to specific places like the Mediterranean, some to India or other Asian countries. There was another route called the Red Sea Route, which brought slaves mostly to areas by the Nile River. So the life of a slave involved a lot of trading and work, which doesn't seem so bad to some, but looking deeper into conditions of the voyages, what they worked for, and many other things show that they had it pretty bad. We're going to take you through the life of a slave to give some context and detail to how different their lives were from ours. Some slaves were born into slavery. If their mother were a slave, then they were automatically a slave. 
others were just kidnapped and taken to other countries. They either began working when they were very young or after they were brought to other places. Now back to the Middle Passage. It was a great introduction to what kind of a life they were about to go into. The voyage from Africa to the Americas was crowded and unsafe. Men were squished into the lower level with no room, while women and children were sometimes allowed to move around on the upper level, but that put them at risk for violence or sexual abuse. The people on board only got fed twice a day, and their meals were not that nutritious either. They were also at constant risk of disease. Diseases like smallpox, the flu, and dysentery were very common among ship ships. They were constantly surrounded by a dangerous environment, always at risk of abuse, disease, and also revolts. So the middle passage set the stage well for disease, violence, and unfairness that they would experience once they reached land. When they arrived, slaves were put in a prison, examined by surgeons, and separated based on the examination by good slaves or invalid ones. Invalid slaves were thrown out, and the rest were numbered and marked so that their slaves wouldn't get mixed up with slaves of another country. Each slave was then sent to a plantation, farm, or other place, and were usually separated from their families at this point. They were set to work right away, either getting paid next to nothing or simply nothing. Throughout the journey from Africa to America and while working, many slaves tried to organize revolts, or some resisted in smaller ways. However, resistance almost always resulted in some form of punishment, and after more people started resisting, the Europeans became even more paranoid, making the environment only more violent and worse. All of these conditions led to a lot of death, especially within the first few years. Slaves died in many different ways. Some resisted and were killed, some died from old age, and many died from either disease, starvation, or exhaustion. Some even died from suicide. Women found other ways to resist since they did different work a lot of the time. They would usually just do their job poorly, fake being sick, or in some extreme cases, they would poison their owners. Women had it just as tough as the men did, but in different ways. There are even some accounts of women having abortions or killing their babies to keep them from the torture and horror of slavery. So they had it pretty rough, and their situation never seemed to get any better. There was nowhere to find hope for a long time. There were, however, small glimpses of hope when some had the courage to resist or revolt, even in the dangerous environment they were constantly surrounded by. We'll talk more about it later, but some revolts brought change and even the end of slavery in some places. But at that time, things weren't getting any better when the French king Louis, Louis XIV created the Code Noir in 1685. Essentially, the Code Noir kept slaves from being able to own any property and they had no control over their lives. Their marriages, burials, punishments, and conditions all had to be met without question if they ever wanted freedom. The Code Noir pretty much destroyed the hope of the slaves it affected because it gave the government control over the slave trade and it was trying to provide a legal framework for slavery, which only meant things probably wouldn't be getting any better anytime soon. Some examples of laws that were passed through the Code Noir as seen in the West and the world include We prohibit our white subjects of either sex from marrying blacks on plane of punishment and fine or In no circumstance may a slave be made to testify for or against his or her master and many others. These things simply prove how strictly their lives were controlled, which they obviously didn't like, especially at the start and towards the end. They didn't like the loss of freedom, so many would get angry, strike back when they were punished, or even try and escape before they were put on ships. And because of that, re revolts slowly became a bit more popular. Many tried to revolt by taking over ships or finding weapons and threatening others, but most were very unsuccessful and resulted in death or injuries or me of many people involved. Sadly, some resisted simply by committing suicide, usually by jumping overboard. Many have said something similar to this. Slaves naturally resisted their enslavement because slavery was fundamentally unnatural. One of the very well-known parts of slavery resistance was the Underground Railroad, which was essentially a network of people helping escaped slaves with shelter and aid, or even helping slaves escape. The Underground Railroad was a series of secret paths and safe houses with routes located across America that led into Canada. It was mostly used by escaped slaves who were trying to get to freedom in Canada. People called Quakers were thought to be the first organized group to help slaves who had escaped, which started in the late 18th century. 
People like the Quakers became more well known to the slaves by using code words to talk about the Underground Railroad without the wrong people finding out. Conductors were people who guided fugitives. Stations, safe houses, and depots were what they would call safe homes, churches, or schoolhouses. There were even quilts that people would put on their homes to communicate with escaped slaves, each with a different meaning. After long, dangerous journeys, many slaves made it to Canada, where they didn't exactly have equality, but at least they had their freedom. Between 1850 and 1860, about 15,000 to 20,000 escaped slaves reached Canada, or present-day Ontario. Although they were free from slavery, their lives weren't perfect. Canada still had a lot of division when it came to races. There were specific schools, churches, or sections on buses or in movie theaters for blacks and a separate, usually better condition part for whites. But still, it was a lot better than the lives they had lived in America. The change of attitude towards slavery came largely through the movement of abolitionism. This movement was born from the resistance and disapproval of slavery. This movement was most prevalent from 1783 to 1888. It was incredibly powerful because it brought people of all races together to demand the abolition or end of the legally recognized institution of slavery. So essentially, the movement of abolitionism brought about the end of slavery. Well, first it brought the end of the slave trade, but it did eventually lead to the end of slavery as well. Some very important people to this movement were actually freed slaves who fought to free other slaves and helped others escape to Canada. Olada Aquano and Frederick Douglass were freed slaves who were some of the most vocal advocates for the movement of abolitionism. They both overcame immense adversaries in their lives and learned how to read and write in order to help spread their message of abolitionism. Another important person to the movement was Harriet Tubman. She was also a freed slave who became an abolitionist. Tubman led many other freed slaves to safety through the Underground Railroad. She was a very successful conductor of the Underground Railroad, and she never lost a passenger. When trekking across America, the Underground Railroad's conductors and passengers would often sing songs to keep themselves in good spirits despite the dire conditions. One song that was sung at this time is called Wade in the Water. The clip of the song that we're about to play is sung by Ella Jenkins. Songs like Wade in the Water were sung to temporarily escape the harsh conditions, both along the Underground Railroad and enslaved plantations. These songs often have major spiritual components, as faith in a better world and redemption was important. The movement of abolitionism occurred during the height of the Atlantic slave trade, which was also in the 1780s. Also at this time, two British abolitionists called Thomas Clarkson and William Wilberforce issued a parliamentary inquiry into the slave trade. This inquiry revealed the horrors of the treatment of slaves and discussed the ethics of the slave trade. 
Ultimately, this inquiry led to the end of British slave trade in 1807. This created a domino effect and the United States and other European countries also abolished the slave trade. Unfortunately, this did not mean the end of slavery, but just the end of the slave trade. In 1833, Britain finally abolished slavery completely. Once again, this created a domino effect and many other nations and countries followed suit and abolished slavery, as they felt pressure from Britain. Most European countries were the first to follow suit. Most Islamic countries legally abolished slavery in the 1840s. However, that was incredibly difficult to enforce as the land was expansive and the people didn't all listen. This led to European countries creating anti-slavery crusades where European countries would take over Asian and African countries, justifying it by saying they were doing it to abolish slavery in the area. Some of the last countries to completely abolish slavery were the United States in 1863, Cuba in 1886, and Brazil in 1888. The end of slavery in America occurred during the American Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865. This war was fought between the southern states and the rest of America. The southern states consisted of South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. The main cause of this four-year war was slavery. The southern United States wanted to keep slavery as the southern economy relied heavily on plantations run by slave labor. The rest of the states, or the northerners, were beginning to modernize and had an economy that ran on other forms of profit like railroads. The northern states had also begun to diversify and became more progressive in their ways of thinking, which led many to the obvious conclusion that slavery was inhumane and wrong. Many people from the northern states formed the Union Army to fight against slavery. President Lincoln was also against slavery as he was part of the Union Army. In the midst of the bloody Civil War, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. This proclamation stated that all persons held as slaves within the southern states are and henceforth forward shall be free. So basically, Lincoln declared that all slaves within the United States were free. This declaration lit a new fire in the hearts of Northerners as it allowed black men to serve in the Union Army. Eventually, after a hard and bloody war, the Union Army prevailed and beat the southern states. They succeeded in freeing the slaves from plantations in the south. And, in 1865, the 13th Amendment was added to the American Constitution. This amendment stated that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So with that, slavery was abolished in the United States. Cuba abolished slavery in 1886, which is over 20 years after the United States. Cuba was a Spanish colony, and from the 1840s on was extremely important for Spanish manufactured goods, especially sugar. By the 1860s, Cuba was responsible for producing one-third of the world's sugar, and it did so cheaply by using slave labor. However, the Cubans were not satisfied being under Spanish rule anymore. Spain had been increasing their taxes and refused to grant Cubans political autonomy, so the Cubans revolted. The Ten Years' War, from 1868 to 1878, was a big part of Cuba's fight for independence from Spain. The Ten Years' War gave many Cubans the mindset to fight for their rights, which led to much unrest in the sizable slave population. This led to Cuba finally completely abolishing slavery in 1886. Only two years after that, Brazil finally abolished slavery as well. Brazil heavily depended on slavery, as a large portion of its population was made up of slaves. An approximate 25% of Brazil's population was slaves. Many in Brazil believed that abolishing slavery would lead to chaos due to the immense amount of slaves. However, the slaves in Brazil saw that slavery was being abolished in other countries and they wanted change as well. In the 1870s and 1880s, protests against slavery from slaves and Brazilian citizens became increasingly louder. The protests from so many people became harder and harder for the Brazilian government to ignore. So in 1888, slavery was completely abolished in Brazil. With the end of slavery, many countries needed to figure out substitutes for the free labor slaves provided, especially countries like the United States and Brazil, who depended heavily on that free labor.
Brazil, due to the large population numbers of freed slaves, they continued to provide labor with the proper payment of course. Immigrants from other places also provided labor. In the Americas, many Indians immigrated to work under contracts. Uh, often, when this contract was over, they would go back to live in India. In the United States, freed slaves would still provide labor for plantations, but they were given, quote unquote, adequate economic compensation. Pretty much, it was just a scheme made by the plantation owners to make the freed slaves fall into debt so they'd be forced to stay on the farm and try to work it off. Thankfully, slavery was made completely illegal, and it still is. However, it created a lasting impact that can still be seen in our world today. Slavery was absolutely awful, and the abuse slaves suffered is horrifying. People may think that, oh, slavery happened so long ago that it doesn't affect anyone today, but that's completely false. Slavery created this multi-generational trauma, fueled by centuries of abuse, that descendants of slaves still feel today. Another huge consequence of slavery is racism, specifically towards people that are of African descent. Historically, people that are black have been seen as less than people that are white, and unfortunately, some people still carry this belief of white supremacy. Due to ignorant people like that, in an inherently racist society, people of color still suffer. Movements protesting the systematic racism have become increasingly popular over the last few years as they grow on social media platforms and more people become informed. One of the biggest movements is Black Lives Matter or BLM. BLM states their mission on their website, saying that their mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes. It is important to support movements like BLM and to stay informed so you can be part of the solution to the issue and not contribute to the problem. We both encourage you all to work to be part of the solution and to do your part in ending racism. Thank you very much for listening to our podcast on Africa and the slave trade. We hope you learned lots. Once again, this is Karina and Terza. Bye.